In the headlines of VTV News, according to Prime Minister Science Technology Foundation for Nations Development. Barrio Vungto strives to attract foreign direct investment. And later on in our world news, U.S. promises Ukraine military aid. Broadcasting from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, VTV News starts right now. Hello and welcome to VTV News. This is the top news of the hour. On May the 15th, Prime Minister Phạm Minh Ching stated that science and technology are important driving forces for boosting economic growth, creating breakthroughs, productivity, and increasing the national competitive edge as the country is developing its socialist-oriented market economy. At a ceremony to mark the Vietnamese Science and Technology Day and the 65th founding anniversary of the Ministry of Science and Technology, he said science and technology are vital elements for the country to catch up with the world amidst the fourth industrial revolution related technology boom. He mentioned the success stories of such powers as the Republic of Korea, Japan, China and the US, Germany and Finland in which science and technology played a great role. The Prime Minister stressed that the party and state have rolled out various policies to develop scientific technology and promote the role of scientists and intellectuals working in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. A a resolution adopted at the 13th Party Congress identifying science and technology, innovation and digital transformation as a key motive for economic growth. As a result, he ordered competing sectors to complete related mechanisms, attract and diversify resources for science and technology, develop the science market and pay due attention to research and development activities, among others. Prime Minister Phạm Minh Ching has just issued a dispatch on handling illegal, unreported and unregulated or IUU fishing through the Vessel Monitoring System or VMS. The telegram emphasizes the efforts needed to get the EU's yellow card for IUU fishing removal in this fifth inspection. Specifically, the Prime Minister has requested authorities and localities raise the awareness to leaders on the issue, focusing on drastically implementing solutions to combat IUU violations. It is it is also necessary to implement programs on raising awareness of fishermen on the regulation. The Prime Minister requested the People's Committees of Coastal Provinces and Cities to review and ensure that 100% of fishing vessels over 15 meters install the vessel monitoring system and maintain its connection by the third quarter. At the same time, the Prime Minister assigned the Ministry of National Defense to promptly detect, investigate and verify information on violations. The Ministry must thoroughly and strictly handle cases of fishing vessels violating VMS regulations. Acting State President Vati Engson hosted receptions in Hanoi on May the 15th for ambassadors of Armenia, New Zealand, Turkish and Peru to came uh, to present their credentials, meeting Ambassador of um, Armenia, Suren Badasarian. The Vietnamese leader said Vietnam always appreciates the support from the people of the former Soviet Union, including Armenia, to Vietnam's past struggle for national independence and reunification. At the reception for New Zealand ambassador Caroline Rachel Beresford, the acting state president affirmed the importance Vietnam attaches to cooperation with New Zealand and highlighted the progress in the bilateral ties in trade, tourism and education. Receiving Turkish ambassador Kohan Kemik, the acting state president, stressed that uh, Turkish is Vietnam's second largest export market in West Asia and biggest investor in the Middle East. She expressed her wish to soon welcome the president of Turkey in Vietnam to further promote the bilateral cooperation. At the meeting with Ambassador Peru, Patricia Yolanda Reyes Poto Carreo, the acting president said Vietnam always values its friendship and cooperation with Peru and suggested the two countries forge cooperation in politics, diplomacy, economy, trade, investment, culture, tourism and people-to-people -people exchange. 
Now, under the chair of Chen Tengmen, National Assembly Standing Vice Chairman, the National Assembly Standing Committee on Wednesday discussed a report on results of supervision over the responses to voters' opinions, voters' requests sent to the sixth session of the 15th National Assembly and a report on reuse and anti-wistfulness in 2023. More to follow. According to reports, 2,216 opinions and requests collected through voter meetings have been sent to relevant agencies. To date, 2,204 have been responded, reaching 99.5 percent. Thanks to voters' opinions, the National Assembly has made many improvements in terms of legal development and supervision activities. They hope for solutions to effectively overcome existing issues and recommended strengthening investigations and supervision of the gold market and gold trading enterprises. According to Vietnam's report on thrift practice and anti-wastefulness in 2023, the country has effectively managed expenditure and saved more than 3.2 billion U.S. dollars which is more savings than in 2022. However, there are 91-115 ministries, agencies, and localities where the disbursement rate of public investment capital is below average. Delegates suggested continuing to tighten financial discipline, promote public investment budgets, promptly handle violations, and completely resolve the waste of land resources. Also on the same day, National Assembly Standing Committee discussed the 2022 State Budget Settlement Report, the ratification of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the preparation for the NA 7th session drafting a report of voters and people's requests. Speaking at the closing of the 33rd session, Standing Vice Chairman of the National Assembly Tran Ton Man stated that the 7th session will consider 39 issues of which 24 are legislative issues. He requested relevant ministries and agencies ensure progress, proactively and urgently receive and complete reports to present to the National Assembly, and thoroughly prepare to ensure the success of the session. Standing Vice Chairman of the National Assembly, Chen Tengmen, hosted a reception in Hanoi on May the 15th for André Flahout, member of the Belgian Chamber of Representatives, Minister of State and former President of the Chamber of Representatives. The Vietnamese leader affirmed that Vietnam always considers Belgium an important partner in the European Union and stressed that the multifaceted cooperation between the two countries, including parliamentary relations, has been growing fruitfully. He used this occasion to thank the Belgian a Chamber of Representatives for its ratification of a resolution in support of Agent Orange Dioxin victims in Vietnam, to which Flaholt made significant contributions. He suggested the two sides continue with their close coordination and called for more practical support for the Belgian side to Vietnam in finance, technology and personnel development in dioxin remediation. He also called on Belgium to urge the European Commission to soon lift its yellow card warning against Vietnamese seafood. In, a, in reply, Flahal told his host that the Belgian parliament has completed procedures related to the cooperation agreement between the two legislatures and will soon send it to the Vietnamese side. Now, receiving Vice President of Huawei Asia Pacific Jun Zhang on Wednesday, Deputy Prime Minister Chen Liu Guang expressed appreciation for Huawei's presence and contributions in Vietnam over the past years. The Deputy Prime Minister hopes that Huawei will continue to invest in Vietnam in areas where Huawei has advantages such as telecommunications, digitization, artificial intelligence, and green transformation. Listening to Huawei's wishes to participate in the digital transformation process in general and 5G infrastructure in particular in Vietnam, the Deputy Prime Minister said this is a potential field for them and asked Huawei to coordinate and effectively de deploy a signed memorandum of understanding on information and communication technology human resource development. In the first four months of this year, Barrio Vungto province has attracted more than 1.52 billion U.S. dollars of newly registered foreign direct investment, making it the number one province in the country for attracting foreign capital flows. This is a positive signal showing the attractiveness of the investment environment in Barrio Vungto for foreign investors. 
Lam Sun Petrochemical Complex with a total investment of more than five billion US dollars is one of the largest foreign investment projects in Vietnam and has chosen Bà Rịa Vũng Tàu Province to deploy construction on an area of 464 hectares. Bà Rịa Vung Tau is a favorable place for us to build the Long Sun Petrochemical Complex. In particular, the province always accompanies and shares difficulties with businesses during the investment and operation process. Barivonta province has regularly organized dialogues with businesses to handle difficulties and promote administrative procedures. Barivonta also established a special working group 997 to resolve problems for businesses and investors in the locality. Working Group 997 has been a special working group for us to resolve individual and long-standing difficulties, hence, create trust between locality, businesses and investors. We are increasingly supporting businesses in registering business documents and procedures, and solving difficulties and problems in the most timely and effective way. Bà Rịa Vũng Tàu province is slowly defying its image as a land rich in potential and promising for foreign direct investors. This is the condition for Bà Rịa Vũng Tàu to realize its goal of attracting over $2 billion in FDI capital this year. Vietnam is increasingly welcoming many large cargo ships due to its commercial position and its deployment, development of seaport infrastructure. In the last five years, the number of large ships entering Vietnam's deep sea ports had increased by more than 20 percent, contributing 27.5 million US dollars to the budget. However, Vietnam could lose its competitive advantage if it fails to bring in enough large ships. More to follow. The cost of transporting goods by large ships is nearly 15% cheaper compared to small ships. Vietnamese goods can be exported directly to European and American countries faster. This is an opportunity for Vietnam to become a large transit hub in the future. Despite the economic benefits, some Vietnamese seaports are currently facing the risk of losing revenue because channels cannot accommodate large ships. Other maritime channels have not been allocated funds for regular dredging or have not been able to find a suitable location to dump dredge material. The planned depth of the channel is not guaranteed, therefore limiting the number of large ships entering Vietnamese seaports. If we cannot receive large ships, for example in the Ho Chi Minh City, Baria, Vung Tau area, these large ships will go to Singapore and prices will increase. Vietnam has about 30 sea routes directly connecting the U.S. and Europe, with an output of import and export goods of nearly 675 million tons per year. If Vietnam does not invest in upgrading infrastructure at deepwater seaports soon, the country will waste the opportunity to become an international maritime transshipment center and lose thousands of billions of Vietnamese dollars in revenue for maritime fees. Coming up next, ceremony marks 65th anniversary of Ho Chi Minh Trail. And railway and road trips on rise. watching VTV News. A ceremony was held on Wednesday to grant the First Class Fatherland Defense Order Medal to Army Corps 12 in carrying out military and national defense tasks on the occasion of the 65th anniversary of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the traditional day of Chuang Sơn Army Corps, May the 19th. Comrade Nguyen Xuân Thắng, Politburo member, president of the Ho Chi Minh National Academy of Politics and chairman of the Central Theoretical Council, attended the ceremony. The Ho Chi Minh Trail
trail has a total length of 17,000 kilometers. On this trail, the Trường Sơn soldiers of Group 559 transported over 1.5 million tons of goods and 5.5 million tons of petroleum, ensuring sufficient goods to 1.1 million officers and soldiers who marched into the southern battlefield. Following the tradition of Trường Sơn soldiers, Army Corps 12 continues to perform tasks assigned by the Labor Army completing construction of national strategic infrastructure works. These include airport projects and 12 North-South Expressway packages. A seminar on solutions to protect the Mekong Delta was held in Kanta City on Wednesday morning. According to experts and scientists attending the event, the Mekong Delta is one of the most susceptible areas to climate change, which has already begun to cause worsened subsidence, landslides, drought, water uh, intrusion, salt water intrusion, and a lack of water for production and daily activities. The whole region currently has more than 800 landslide areas with a total length of more than one thousand kilometers on average the region losses 300 to 500 hectares of land each year due to riverbank and coastal erosion in Kamau province alone from 2011 until now more than 350 kilometers of coastline has eroded causing the loss of more than 5,300 hectares of productive land residential land and mangrove forests to deal with this situation scientists recommend a more effective and sustainable approach Approach. These include focusing on irrigation to ensure water security, adopting technology for infrastructure construction, and fostering a green economy to improve natural disaster resilience of businesses and communities. By 2025, 100% of expressways will be equipped with smart traffic systems. This is one of the goals set out in the plan to apply technology to road management approved by the Prime Minister. Realizing this goal is one of the key tasks set by the Ministry of Transport, uh, as it will contribute to ensuring traffic safety and protecting infrastructure. At any given time, 45 officers work at the Hanoi Hai from Expressway Operations Center. They operate 58 surveillance cameras that monitor the entire route. Any accidents that occur are detected to provide timely solutions and ensure smooth traffic flow. Information about the traffic situation on the route is posted on the LED screens to notify drivers. From this information, they can choose the most appropriate path. Additionally, an automatic load weighing system has been installed to support the center in road management and operation. The automatic load weighting system will promptly detect oversized and overloaded vehicles. The data will be transmitted in the operation center, helping us reject these vehicles. This ensures safety and maintains road quality. Although it is effective so far out of more than 30 expressways with a total length of 1,829 kilometers put into operation, only eight have had investments in smart traffic systems. This is the reason why the Ministry of Transport has directed units to urgently review and invest in completing the intelligent traffic system and the operation centers for expressway projects, especially the components of the North-South Expressway. Capital has been mobilized to deploy the smart traffic system for the components of the North-South Expressway Project Phase 1. For Phase 2 component projects, the Ministry of Transport has started reviewing plans to concurrently implement the smart traffic system and load wedging system once these projects go into operation. The Ministry of Transport is actively developing standard regulations for the operation of smart traffic systems. The Ministry also requires units to use the same management software to ensure connectivity. This is crucial as traffic control centers for adjacent expressways will be linked, ensuring synchronized management operations. 
Summer is the peak season for domestic travel. With a surge in airplane tickets recently, many tourists have switched to traveling by train or driving their cars. In the first quarter of this year, the railway industry welcomed 1.68 million passengers, an increase of 13.6 percent over the same period. Apart from lifting pressure on the aviation industry, the rise of rail and road travel has also opened up various new tour routes. The Hue Da Nang train route passes through various attractions, including Haven Pass, Lanco Bay, and Tien Sa Port. The train carriages boast modern design and provide a comfortable experience to passengers. I feel very excited and happy to be one of the first tourists on this journey. As the demand for rail travel surges, Hanoi and Saigon railways are enjoying profits three times higher than the targets during the first quarter. The railway industry has put significant efforts into renewing its services to customers. We have upgraded the carriages for high-quality trains. We also adopted a new service approach, lending full-trip chapter trains following customer requirements. In the first quarter this year, the number of carriages increased by 11 percent, passenger numbers increased by 14 percent, while revenue went up by 16 percent over the same period last year. Many tourists have opted for nearby destinations with road travel. To seize this trend, tourist agencies are diversifying their car and train routes, offering customers cheaper costs to simulate domestic traveling demand. This trend will support businesses to overcome difficulties in transportation access. Passengers will be more likely to visit closer destinations. In May, the number of passengers traveling by train was estimated to be 600,000, an increase of 16 percent over the same period. This change in travel preferences has opened up opportunities for localities to build new tourism products. Lotus is one of the key industries in Dong Tha province. Recently, the province has implemented many solutions to increase the value of Lotus. These include developing tourism products and services, organizing the introduction, promotion and supply of Lotus products, and promoting Lotus cuisine. In response to the Dong Tha Lotus Festival, which will take place from May the 16th to the 19th, tourist businesses in the province have created many dishes made from Lotus. Their aim is to make this year's festival an unforgettable moment for visitors. Roasted chicken, steamed fish, hot pot and many other dishes are imbued with different elements of the lotus plant. This special menu has been developed several months in advance to prepare for the second Dong Tap Lotus Festival, promoting the province specialty. My restaurant has prepared special lotus menu items for this year's festival, introducing Dong Tap's lotus through cuisine. That is also one of the ways to enhance Dong Tap's popularity as a tourist destination. In addition to familiar dishes, lotus root salad with shrimp and meat, and chicken stewed with lotus root, the chefs have also created a number of dishes featuring the Mekong Delta's characteristics. These new dishes were developed following a training class organized by the Provincial Department of Culture, Sports and Tourism. We are introducing new dishes at the second Dong Thap Lotus Festival to diversify the province's tourism products. The festival also supports lotus farmers and contributes to spreading Dong Thap's image. The second Lotus Festival event is an opportunity to attract a large number of tourists to Dong Thap for visits, experiences and enjoyment of local cuisine. Therefore, our expectation is that after the training course on skills in processing lotus dishes, the tourism units will become ambassadors of Dong Thap Lotus cuisine, introducing it to both domestic and foreign tourists. According to the Dong Tap Department of Culture, Sports and Tourism, with 200 dishes made from lotus, the province is in the process of building the lotus cuisine brand associated with each tourist attraction in the province. This is gradually bringing lotus dishes to both local people and tourists and spreading the love of lotus to everyone. Coming up next in our world news, U.S. promises Ukraine military aid. And Russia put submarine-launched Bulava intercontinental missile into service. 
U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has made his fourth trip to Ukraine since the Russia-Ukraine conflict began in February 2022. The trip is the first by a senior U.S. official since the $61 billion military aid package was approved by the U.S. Congress last month. During this visit, Blinken reaffirmed the ultimate goal of bring, uh, bringing Kyiv closer to the North Atlantic Cooperation Organization, or NATO, and eventually making it a member. Accordingly, the Washington summit in July will outline tangible steps to support Ukraine in building a resilient, capable force supporting its ongoing reforms and better integrating Ukraine into the alliance. Meanwhile, Russia's foreign ministry on Wednesday said that it will destroy all military equipment that was supplied to Ukraine by the United States. Russia has put its submarine-launched Bulava intercontinental ballistic missile into service, according to its state media on Tuesday. This missile is considered a key element in the modernization of Russia's nuclear arsenal. According to the Missile Defense Project at the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Bulava has a range of 8,300 kilometers and a payload of up to 10 multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles capable of delivering nuclear warheads to different targets. Last November, the country's defense ministry said one of those submarines had successfully test-launched the Bulava. It was fired from an underwater position in the White Sea of northern Russia and hit a target thousands of kilometers away on the Kamchatka Peninsula in the Far East. According to Russian news agency, Russia's northern and Pacific fleets now include seven Bore submarines and each carries 16 Bulavas. Advanced industries, including electric vehicles, data centers, artificial intelligence, and semiconductors, require a substantial amount of energy. The rapid development of these industries has led to electricity shortages in many industrially developed countries, despite the unprecedented concern of electricity shortages over the last few decades. The United States, a hub for both tech giants and high-tech manufacturing factories, faces the threat of power shortages sooner than many other countries. In Arizona, worries are mounting that the current power grid will not be able to handle the demand within the next decade, raising concerns about grid safety. According to Boston Consulting Group, in 2022, data centers consumed 2.5 percent of the total electricity used in the United States. This level is equivalent to the electricity demand of one-third of U.S. households. As a result, since January last year, the Virginia state legislature has proposed a law to limit the construction of additional data centers. Meanwhile, Singapore and the city of Amsterdam and Netherlands temporarily stopped building additional data centers. Yamanashi Prefecture in central Japan says it will launch an online system to regulate the number of people who climb Mount Fuji. The mountain has always been popular with local and overseas tourists, but a recent surge in inbound tourists to Japan has led to high level of pollution and other strains, forcing authorities to take drastic measures. Mount Fuji climbers will be required to pay fees through a new online system, which will become accessible from May 20 through the official website for climbers operated by the Environment Ministry and Yamanashi and Shizuoka prefectures, starting from this year's summer climbing season, which begins on July 1st. Those who plan to climb Mount Fuji from the Yamanashi side will be asked to make a reservation through the system. The fee system will be used to limit the number of climbers to 4,000 per day and collect a 2,000 yen fee, or about 12.8 US dollars, from each person. The measure is aimed at protecting the environment and preventing accidents. Yamanashi Prefecture expects that the new fee system will help avoid confusion at the entrance of the mountain as people will register their information in advance. That's, that's cheap. That, I feel like that's reasonable. Yeah. Maybe even more because this is a nice area, it needs to be upkept and people work here and they need to get paid, you know. Mount Fuji was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site 10 years ago, further boosting its popularity. But the distinction requires that Japan would solve the problems of overcrowding, 
reducing the environmental harm wrought by visitors, and fixing the artificial landscape. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. And that's it for this edition of VTV News. Thank you very much for watching. To rewatch our program, you can download VTV Go from App Store, or Google Play, or tune in our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash VTV4Go. See you again at 3 p.m. local time. Goodbye for now.